deck of a tug is not the easiest place to work. Heavy swells, high winds, strong tides, heavy equipment and massive loads combine to make it a difficult and sometimes dangerous place. But the work done is invaluable. In today's shipping market, the size of vessels is increasing faster than ports can grow to accommodate them. Harbour operations are becoming more complex. Time pressures and increasing traffic are making ever greater demands on tugs. To meet the challenge, tug crews depend on the professionalism of vessel crews. Good teamwork between everyone involved is essential. But teamwork requires a shared understanding of towing techniques, tug capabilities, and the ship's requirements. It requires effective communications between the pilot, tug master, bridge team, and deck crew. It also depends on both crews fully understanding what is going to happen and when. Where and when will the operation begin? When will it finish? What manoeuvres will take place? For harbour operations, it is essential that standard plans and procedures are agreed in advance by pilots, tugmasters and port authorities. Relevant procedures should be relayed to each vessel's master before arrival. These will provide the foundation for individual plans for each operation. There are many elements to consider. Where best to pick up a tow? off the fairway boy or nearer the berth. Where is the vessel berthing and what is the best approach, taking wind and tide into consideration? How many tugs are required and what type of support is expected? A tug on the bow is normally used to assist manoeuvring at low speed. A long side or hip toes are used when extra manoeuvrability is required in restricted waters. Escort towage can assist steering and braking from the stern. Combinations of these techniques are often employed. Sometimes all that is required is passive escort, where the tug is standing close by for support if needed. It is important that the pilot is aware of the safe working load for the vessel's bits and fair leads and is able to relate these to the power of each tug and its line. Different tug types have different qualities and different strengths. Today, stern driven tugs are either conventional or azimuth stern drive or ASD. ASDs can tow over the stern in the conventional mode or over the bow in tractor mode. For ship handling, an ASD will tow over the bow, in effect working as a tractor tug. Tractor tugs with propulsion at the front are very agile. There are two major designs. Point 
Schneider and Azimuth tractor. Recently, a new breed of highly manoeuvrable mini tugs for harbour operations has entered service. Each type offers a different balance of power and manoeuvrability. Each has different capabilities and different limitations. Their suitability for various tasks should be assessed by pilots and tugmasters. And the interesting thing there is the ratio between the uh, the head and stern bottle pull is 67 tons. And included in the standard operational plans. In briefing the master of a vessel, the pilot should explain these operational plans. Once we get off the berth, we can let go of the forward tug, command and push. A fully completed standard pilot card should be presented. During the master-pilot exchange of information, the vessel's master should provide the pilot with key information, such as the safe working load for the vessel's bits and leads. And the safe working load of the bits? 60 tons. Their position and the minimum steerage speed for the vessel. From these exchanges, the best making fast position and approach by any tug should be agreed. The master and pilot should also discuss whether the vessel is reinforced to take the tug in the pushing position. Whether the vessel's lines or the tug's lines should be used. What is the best method for picking up and casting off a tow line? the minimum speed for picking up a line, the maximum safe speed possible with tugs made fast. On the approach, where best to secure so that a steady course and speed can be maintained. Second, could we have the radios on that one on 12 and that one on channel 9 please? the working channels for radio communications. With the plan agreed, the risks involved should be assessed. The forces involved in towage operations are considerable. the weight of equipment to be manhandled, the power of winches, capstans and engines, and the forces of wind, wave and tide. There is the vast difference in power, size and manoeuvrability of the vessels involved. Taken together, these can create a volatile and hazardous environment in which mistakes can have serious consequences. The risk assessment must be methodical and reflect the operational plan. Each phase should be considered and evaluated. And this takes time. What risks are there in each manoeuvre? What hazards will be presented by the equipment used? Where would equipment failure present the greatest danger? Who is most at risk on both vessels? What will happen if communications fail? Telax ready for lift, thank you. Will other vessels' movements create a hazard? And where? What effect will wind and tide have? Is visibility likely to deteriorate during the operation? Have the hazards from the vessel's cargo been taken into consideration? What contingency plans are there? If there is a problem, what action will be taken? 
do the pilot and tugmaster agree? That's fine. Yeah, that's fine. Yeah, OK, Gareth, thanks a lot. Thanks, man. Accidents have a habit of growing from a series of failures. For tugs, arriving on time is essential. It avoids risks occurring from hasty assessments and late control. It is also good practice to allow extra time for unforeseen difficulties. Sorry, wait on starboard bell. With communications, people, or equipment. All equipment must be regularly inspected and maintained. A worn tow rope or a bad lead may cause a line to part and control of the vessel may not be recovered before an accident occurs. When a line parts, there is extreme danger for anyone nearby. An engine failure when towing may cause the tug to be overrun by the towed vessel. It is essential for the tug winch release to function under load. It should be tested before every towage operation. The tug master should assess the pilot's instructions and query any that seem unclear or inappropriate. And, uh, repeat the warden, please. That's when you're ready, push on, easy power. Roger, push on, easy power. The tug deck crew should be properly briefed on the operation, the tax bridge. however routine or obvious it may seem. Yep, we'll be going up to the process hill. We'll be connecting centre lead aft. That's all we it is equally important that the vessel's deck crew is briefed on the plan and what is required of them at each stage. Where are lines required? To what should they be made fast? And when? For the deck crews to perform their task effectively, equipment must work faultlessly. Inspection and maintenance is essential. Roller pins on fair leads may wear and fracture if not regularly greased and inspected. A damaged fair lead can destroy a costly rope or cause a personal injury. Bits and chocks are subjected to heavy loads during towage. They should be inspected regularly to ensure they are in good condition. Ropes and wires can also fail if not maintained. Wires should be checked for corrosion or kinks and oiled or greased regularly. Ropes should be checked for chafing and splices for security. It is common for there to be confusion about which bits are designed for low stress tasks such as mooring, or securing barges alongside, and which are designed for towage. It has been known for incorrectly used bits to be ripped right out of the deck. Masters should know the safe working loads of the bits on their vessels and provide this information to the pilot. Now what's the safe working load of your bits? The bits are 60 tons and the bollard in the centre lead aft is 250 tons. Okay. Winches on vessels should never be used to make fast towing lines. They should always be made fast to bits designed for towage operations. Deck crews should be aware of the tug's equipment. It has been known for crews to mistake a tug's messenger line for the tow line and make fast with this. When this happens, the tug cannot apply load and control of the vessel may be lost through the delay. Lighter messenger lines can also be deceptive. The vessel's deck crew may start hauling the messenger line by hand, but then struggle when the heavier tow line hits the water. 
By then, it is too late to employ a winch. Delays occur while more hands are summoned to help. Having sufficient crew to pick up lines and make fast avoids delays and reduces risk. With a properly briefed crew, mistakes such as incorrect bit selection or making fast with the messenger can be avoided. Existing SOLAS regulations require emergency towing equipment on tankers of 20,000 tons deadweight or more. New SOLAS regulations require that emergency towing procedures are provided on all passenger ships by the year 2010 and all existing cargo ships by 2012. Harbour operations have their own specific challenges. With heavy traffic and limited manoeuvring space, vigilance must be maintained. It is important to remember that most harbour towage operations are conducted under contracts which impose liability upon the owner of the towed ship for loss and damage that occurs. Even if this arises as a result of the fault of the tug. This imbalance makes it particularly important for those on board the towed ship to do everything within their power to ensure that the towage proceeds without incident. Planning should include an assessment of the worst case situations and actions that should be taken by all vessels. The aim should be the safety of personnel, the tugs and the ship, as well as damage limitation. Before the operation begins, the master must be satisfied that tugs are adequate for the task. During the operation, it is crucial that both tugmaster and the vessel's pilot understand the constraints under which the other is operating. For instance, many vessels have a minimum speed at which steering control can be maintained. Does the pilot understand the power of the tug? This is important if he is to ask for full power. Roger, full power. From the bridge of a large vessel, the tug will frequently be hidden from sight. The tug master should keep the pilot informed about his manoeuvres. When casting off, as the line is slackened, the swell will often drop the tug and tighten the line. This can be dangerous for the deck crew on the larger vessel handling the line. It is essential for the tug master to remain vigilant and release the load quickly if injuries are to be avoided. Deck crews must keep well clear of tow lines as weight is put on. There are often other tasks such as preparing mooring lines to be accomplished nearby. The danger here is that concentrating on their other tasks, deck crews may fail to see the line moving towards them until too late. Loss of a leg is a heavy price to pay for a moment's carelessness. The tug is always vulnerable to being damaged or overrun by the larger vessel. One of the greatest moments of danger for the tug is when picking up a tow line from the bow. The vessel's overhang can make it difficult for the tug to close. At speed, the tug's steerage can be affected by large bow waves. Hydrodynamic forces can push the tug away and then suddenly suck it into the bows. At this point, it is possible for the tug to be overrun By operating at a safe speed, this interaction can be reduced. 
All in all, this is a vulnerable position that needs to be cleared as quickly as possible. Bulbous bows can be dangerous to tugs, especially when the vessel is laden and the bulb underwater, or when operating at night. The vessel master must make the pilot aware of any underwater obstacles, and warnings should be clearly marked on the vessel's hull. Bow thrusters can also be hazardous. Warning must be given before they are used. When making fast at the vessel's bows, a heaving line should be used that is long enough and light enough to allow the tug to stand off a little. When the line is acquired by the vessel, its deck may be out of sight of the tug. The tug's crew need to know when the line has been made fast as it cannot leave its station until this is confirmed. It is not unusual for a vessel's deck crew to walk away without informing the tug that the line is made fast. This leaves the tug stuck in a potentially dangerous position, unable to move for fear of injuring the vessel's crew. When casting off at the stern, it may be tempting to drop the line onto the tug's deck below. But with freeboards of six meters or more, a heavy tow rope will acquire enough energy to seriously injure the tug crew below. It may also foul the tug's propulsion system if released before the tug is ready to take the line. It is important that the towing line is lowered carefully and that any messenger line is not released until the tug is in a position to retrieve it safely. Many injuries have been caused by throwing weighted heaving lines onto a tug's deck. Heaving lines should contain no additional weight within the monkey's fist. Stern tugs in the escort role can suffer from loss of power as the wash from the vessel can disrupt the propulsion system on the tug. It is essential that the vessel increases power only when the tug is ready and in the escort position. Equally, when a pilot or master goes astern or ahead without warning, the tug can be pulled towards the vessel. Any significant change to engine speed, direction or rudder angle must be notified in advance and acknowledged by the tug master. Well done, push on easy power. Clearly, successful operations depend on effective communications between all parties. Tugs, bridge teams and ship's deck crew fore and aft. Each speaker must identify themselves and keep transmissions short and to the point. Madeline, always say aft, come out onto the port quarter for a lift, Roger. Most pilots have a portable radio and this should be tested with the tug before operations begin. Just test my handheld radio, how do you read? Misinterpretation can lead to an accident. The pilot's orders should be clear, have only one interpretation, and be addressed to a named tug. The tug master should acknowledge the instruction and identify his tug. Thanks, all ready for lift. Ten acts ready for lift, thank you. The difficulty of communicating directly between deck crews on the vessel and those on the tug makes it inevitable that hand signals will be used by both. Standard signals exist to ensure a common understanding. All crews should know them and use them. Stop danger. Emergency stop. Take the strain or hoist slowly. Raise or heave away. Lower. Secure, make fast, or it is made fast.
When operating offshore, the longer timescales make planning and risk assessment more important still. There is more time for weather to change, more time for equipment to fail, and assistance is further away if required. What is the condition of the vessel or rig to be towed? Is it light or is it loaded? What are its draft and air draft? How will wind and current affect the vessel? What tides and currents will prevail during and after the estimated time of arrival? How much fuel is required? Should weather deteriorate seriously, are there any ports of refuge en route? If the destination is a port, what tides are involved and what berthing drafts are available? Voyage planning should be berth to berth. Larger vessels are likely to require the use of more than one tug. This increases the need for careful planning and good communications. Offshore operations entail all the risks associated with harbour operations, but with some crucial additions. The weather is a major consideration. How long will the tow take in fair weather? And how long could it take in poor conditions? Significantly more power is required to tow a vessel in heavy seas. If weather deteriorates, how much extra power is available and how will towing equipment stand up to offshore conditions? What other sea traffic is likely to be encountered? What are the conditions at the reception port? Offshore, tow lines tend to be longer, allowing a greater catenary effect and safeguarding bits and lines. However, wear and tear on lines is greater. Chafing is a constant threat and it is advisable to change the length of line slightly at frequent intervals so that wear at the lead or rail is minimized. It is essential that all equipment, lines, winches, bollards and bits are in good order before setting out. Re-rigging a tow in heavy weather is a difficult and dangerous task. Emergency tow lines must be available on the towed vessel. In a swell, lines are normally lengthened to give greater catenary effect and avoid shock loads on both the tugs and the towed vessel's equipment. The greater distance between tug and tow is a hazard for other shipping. In low visibility, it may not be obvious that the tug and tow are linked, and vessels may try to pass between them. Correct navigation lights and day signals must be used at all times to avoid this risk. Busy sea lanes are particularly hazardous, especially near harbour entrances where crossing traffic is encountered. In congested waters, navigational warnings should be broadcast. A careful lookout using all available means will go a long way to mitigating these risks by ensuring that the tugmaster has a comprehensive picture of traffic around the tug. Whether undertaking harbour or offshore operations, common good practice will help masters and pilots get the best from tugs. Equally, there is much the tug master can do to reduce risks both to his vessel and crew, while ensuring that his customer remains satisfied with the service. Understand the constraints under which other vessels are operating. 
exchange information about minimum steerage speeds. The best speed for making fast, winch loads and bollard design strengths. For harbour operations, standard operating procedures should exist and be updated regularly. For offshore operations, a plan should be created before commencing the tow. Reflect on the risks, both for towage and berthing, and assess ways of reducing them. Then define and agree the best risk management strategy in each case. Ensure communications are sufficient to achieve good cooperation between the bridges and deck crews of both vessels. Slow down. The vessel's speed is crucial. If it is travelling too fast, there is a real risk of accidents. Inform the other vessel and get confirmation before making any significant changes to speed or rudder angles and before initiating any significant manoeuvres. Power should be used with care, both by the pilot and tugmaster. Full power, please. Roger, full power. Be sure about the capacity of bits, which are for mooring and which are for towing operations. Masters need to know the safe working limits for each. Many deck crews are unfamiliar both with towage operations and the special demands of each location. After you may find the rope. It is important they are fully briefed. All should be aware of the vulnerability of both crews. You see my and be equipped with the right personal protective equipment. Treat lines under load with great respect. Tugs can put more than 100 tons weight on a line. Anyone trapped is likely to sustain serious or even fatal injury. Always have sufficient deck crew for the task. Injuries are frequently sustained by crew trying to do too much. <laughs> Ensure all equipment is regularly inspected, well maintained and ready for use. Ensure the right number of tugs is available well in advance. With proper planning, maintenance and training, towage will be a safer 